So as far as video game movies go, <clears throat> Assassin's Creed was bad in in new and surprising ways. Uh, I wasn't really expecting this. Like I was okay. I was expecting it to be bad, um, but I was expecting it to just kind of be, you know, a little bit cheesy, a little bit incoherent, a little bit, a little bit just you know just generically not good. I was not expecting what we actually got though which is something that was highly, highly incoherent and just the, it's a late contender for worst editing of the year. Um, I think Suicide Squad is still going to get that because of uh, bigger, bigger issues with Suicide Squad. Uh, that Suicide Squad managed to be both uh, have moment to moment poor editing as well as scene to scene poor editing just you know big structural deep structural problems with uh, with Suicide Squad um, this you know it, it looks uh, for the most part it looks and flows kind of just like a normal ordinary run-of-the-mill uh, action movie the so the first five Assassin's Creed games, or at least the mainline Assassin's Creed games, all have you in the role of the protagonist, Desmond Miles. And, sorry, okay, the conceit of Assassin's Creed is that you've got a character who is being sent back to experience the lives of their ancestors through DNA genetic memory. It's, it's total just BS garbage woo, and I love it. It's, it's so stupid. And in that regard, Assassin's Creed has a lot of dumb stuff, has a lot of dumb stuff in it. And for the most part, they managed to capture a lot of that. Unfortunately, they didn't capture enough of the fun. Uh, they went a lot with the kind of the very self-serious elements of Assassin's Creed. And so what you end up with is... Uh, I don't remember... The protagonist's name, Cal, maybe it was Cal, like Calvin. Um, but so the first, uh, the first five Assassin's Creed games, your real world protagonist is Desmond Miles, and then he goes into, he goes back and experiences the lives of his ancestors, uh, uh, Ezio, uh, Altair, and Connor. Um, and you get three games with Ezio and, and one with each of the others. And, but Desmond, Desmond in and of himself has become a little bit legendary for being a completely just utterly uninteresting protagonist. Like he has barely any character traits, which in the context of the games, I'm not going to say it's forgivable, but it kind of makes sense in terms of your narrative economy where you're going to want to be focusing on you know, the character that you actually spend most of the time with, most of the game with, which would be the the ancestor. So you spend a lot more time learning kind of who Altair is. You spend a lot more time learning who, uh, uh, who Ezio is. And, you know, that's where just kind of the writing energy goes. That's not to say that you can't make Desmond compelling. It's just that if you had to pick which of those two is going to be boring, you know, if you were forced to pick, if, you know, if you're going to make a bad writing decision, it's it's the least damaging of the two, because you spend way more time with the ancestor than you do with the real world counterpart. So the problem that they ran into here is that they didn't make either of them interesting. I think they understood the uh, problem there, that it's like, okay, it takes a lot of time uh, to really well and truly introduce the audience to um, two protagonists, like if especially if they're not really interacting with one another, if they exist in completely different uh, storylines. So they tr focused a bit more on Cal than on his ancestor, whose name was... Ow. His name was not Al. That was just me. That was Al. 
Amy, what are you doing? You're getting nippy right now. Um, so they spent a lot more time focusing on Cal than on his ancestor, but the the byproduct of that is that they still weren't able to make Cal interesting. We, we don't really know much of anything about him. He killed someone? Like, the movie starts off, or, or I guess the main, the main plot starts off with uh, Cal being executed for murder. Like, he's on death row, and it's like his last day, so he goes through, like, he gets last rites and then goes and gets a lethal injection. And that's kind of, that's your introduction to him as an adult, because there's one scene with him as a kid. Um, and after that, like, you, you don't really learn more about him after that. It's just kind of it. Um, there's, there's little bits here and there. Like, he gets to confront his dad, who murdered his mom, and you learn that she actually kind of murdered herself or got him to do it because, um, because Abstergo, all right, all right. So the, they kept this intact because this, this is the absurdity that I love. So Abstergo is looking for an artifact called the Apple of Eden, which they're going to use to basically mind control the entire world. Um, and they're trying to figure out where it's being hidden. And so, and this is, this is lifted right out of the games. Like this is what they spend the first several games trying to do is track down this artifact and uh and so they're going through basically person's ancestors to be like hey we're following its path and we're trying to figure out where where it got lost where it's sitting right now and then we'll go get it and uh because the ancestor is actually through cal's mother's line she killed herself, got dad to kill her in order to keep the Apple of Eden safe so that Abstergo couldn't stick her into the Animus machine that lets them look at the lives of your ancestors. Um, and, you know, it's it's ridiculous garbage, and I, I, I love that aspect of it. But the, the bad parts are is that you really don't get to know any of these characters, so they're they're kind of meaningless to you. Michael Fassbender as Cal is just completely checked out. He's got almost no dialogue. He just kind of like sneers and looks at stuff and you only get kind of a vague sense of what his motivations are even supposed to be. And then he has a sudden change of heart for really vague reasons that just kind of have to do with his mom or have to do with him, with his ancestor, lose, like, a woman dies, I don't know her name, but she dies, and she was clearly, like, she was clearly the ancestor's, like, you know, his side piece or something, and she dies, and it's all sad if you could bring yourself to care about any of these characters, and that is apparently what gives Cal his change of heart. And then he decides to help the assassins instead of, instead of destroying them because he, uh, he starts off not helping Abstergo, but then is like, okay, I guess I'll help Abstergo. And, and, and then he changes his mind. But then it gets even weirder. Okay, so Marion Cotillard is in this, and she's she's the sort of replacement for Desmond's fish-faced girlfriend, um, who was an Abstergo employee who had a change of heart, except in this case, she's the daughter of the CEO of Abstergo that's run by the Templars. And, and if all of this just kind of sounds like complete nonsense, yeah, yeah. It is, and I kind of love it, but in this case, it's rapidly becoming quite frustrating. And, uh, okay, so Marion Cotillard spends most of the movie telling Cal that she's going to cure aggression. They're going to track down the apple, and it's going to give them the, the cure 
to aggression and to negative emotions and violence and all of this. And then at the very end, okay, so Abstergo manages finding the apple. It's in Christopher Columbus's grave. And they get it, and then they're at their big celebration party where all of the evil people in the world are gathered in one place to be like, Wahaha, we're so evil and we're going to run everything now. And she has this fight with her dad that makes no sense whatsoever because she's just like, this is too far. I can't believe you're going to do this. And he's like, we're going to destroy free will. No one in the world will have free will anymore. And she's like, that's too far. And it's just like, girl, what did you think you were doing? Like, were you not on the same page as everyone else? And so she kind of gives them this, this weird ultimatum that doesn't make any sense. Like, she has, like, it's not just that she has a change of heart. She does Because she doesn't have a change... There isn't really a moment that, that, that indicates that she has changed her opinion about what they're doing. Because she's not saying like, hey, actually I thought about it and this is a bad idea. She's basically accusing him of lying to her. Like, she had other goals all along and he's like, I always knew you were more committed to science than to the Templars. And it's like, what? Like, she's... Her goal is to, like, mind control the entire world. Like, how is she not... How is she not down with this? And so this whole... You know, you lied to me kind... Sort of... Kind of... Take on it is just... I don't know. I, I don't... I don't know what is going on. And then... And then the best part is that shortly after that the movie just kind of ends it it doesn't really have an ending it doesn't have a non-ending either it just ends um you know movies that have non-endings you know if you want to talk like no country for old men has a basically has a non-ending um That's my collarbone. That's my collarbone. She she wants attention. Um all right. All right. All right. Uh so it doesn't really have a no, it doesn't even have a non-ending. It just ends. Um the the assassins storm Evil headquarters steal the apple back, and then all of a sudden, okay, this this is weird, and it's I'm gonna need to explain kind of what's happening. Okay, so when you're talking about like figuring out who the protagonist of a movie is, it it ultimately comes down to uh, the way that the camera behaves towards the character. Uh, or towards the various characters, like the weight that it gives them, the choice of where the edits are made, uh, or like, or who who the edits bias towards. So if we spend, if if something critical happens, and we cut to a character's face, um, that kind of decision made over a period of time like you know made consistently is what is going to really communicate to the audience who the important characters are who are the ones that they should be paying attention to who are the ones that they should be emotionally invested in who's the protagonist um who's the main character and so you end up at the very end where this climax happens and they kill jeremy irons and they steal the apple back and then it spends the resolution of that sequence following Marion Cotillard around rather than the assassins. So it's a switch. It, we, we basically, and she's the one who gets the response monologue and her 
inner sort of response monologue is is not villainous. I don't even remember the content of it anymore. I remember the emotional tone of it, though. I don't remember what she actually says, or like kind of what she sort of thinks about all of this, but she's just, her, her response was not like, oh, I'll get you, you rascally rabbit. Uh, it was, it, it was just kind of like, well, I guess this is the future of the human, you know, it was very end of Terminator 2 kind of, kind of situation, and it was just strange to suddenly have that it's like, all right, our, our emotional center, our protagonist is suddenly switching to Marion Cotillard's character, and then it goes out to Michael Fassbender and he's just standing on a tower looking what someone at Ubisoft thinks is badass and he holds the apple and credits roll and see there's a point where sequel bait like so there's a phrase that a lot of people like to use sequel bait where you're clearly putting in things at the end of your movie that are leading to a sequel. It's basically a some form of jeopardy or some stakes that need to be resolved next. And it has varying degrees of success, but the problem is, is that if you put too many of those in, you're not really... It's not sequel bait anymore. You're setting up the next scene. You're setting up the next sequence. You're setting up the next act of the movie. And so this movie doesn't have a third act because right around the point that it's kind of getting to be like... <sighs> okay, structurally it is a complete incoherent mess because the emotional the your emotional connection to the characters in the movie switch at the last minute from Michael Fassbender's non-character who is not emotionally relatable at all to Marion Cotillard except she's one of the antagonists and she has this change of heart but her change of heart isn't really a change of sides because she doesn't begin to assist them and she she just becomes the new person that we care about and her goals become the ones that we care about and so at the last minute they bait and switch that oh she's the main character now and we care about her and they have stolen from her and so clearly we're going to follow her into the final confrontation where all of this is going to get sorted out and it doesn't happen there is there is no scene there it just it does not happen there's no resolution to it and it goes so far beyond just being sequel bait that it's like there's another scene that this script needs and it's not there um oh geez what else okay so the the action in this and this goes to i think some of the uh uh reasons why i said that it was a late contender for some of the worst editing of the year is the action scenes are completely incomprehensible. They're almost impossible to follow, though it's the fault of both the editor and the cinematographer. Uh, none of the action scenes are shot in any sort of wide, and it never holds on the wide or medium long enough to figure out where people are in relation to one another, where they're going, where they need to get to, where they've come from. Uh, so the spatial relationships are just complete garbage. And the action scenes are shot entirely in really, really tight, fast-swinging close-ups. Um, I've just spent the last couple days spending a lot of time looking at Batman vs. Superman in super slow motion, like frame by frame, because I needed to do a bunch of editing analysis and I was busy putting a bunch of like tracking marks on things and it it really started to stand out to me just how often 
any given frame of Batman versus Superman is just a complete mush of of blur. And this was even worse. This was just e way, way worse. Um, the whole thing is in these like ultra tight close-ups. Like frequently, you know, you're looking at a framing like this or just, you know, basically just a hand. And now those kinds of shots, those kinds of, of punctuation shots are not a bad thing, but they are exactly what they sound like. They're punctuation shots. You use them to drive home a point or to communicate a, a sequence, like they, they end something. Uh, if you build a sentence entirely out of punctuation, it stops meaning anything. It doesn't mean anything anymore. It's just a bunch of symbols. And that's what the action looks like in this, is it's nothing but these ultra tight close-ups and then a half second at most, a quarter to a half second of some sort of like cowboy, not even a wide, like a cowboy shot of someone like jumping out of a window. Um, and then it goes to like an ultra tight of them like landing. And so the movement from place to place is just kind of a general flow and it, it works but the actual like okay a bunch of people are in a room fighting each other that room doesn't look like anything like it's it's almost impossible to tell what that room looks like is anyone else in the room is why this room where are they trying to go How, like what are the stakes if you can't read the scenario, you can't read the stakes. And that brings me to another point, and this goes to the script writer. Uh, when you're dealing with flashbacks or things that happened before the present, the threat of death is poor jeopardy to use. Um, they're constantly trying to build drama to build jeopardy by using, oh, is... I really wish I could remember that character's name. You know, is the ancestor dude, is this dude going to die? Like, he's in this life-threatening situation. Is this going to be it for him? And it's like, no, it's it's clearly not. We, we explicitly, by the conceits of the fiction, know that it is not. And so there... There is no drama. If, if the only drama, if the only beat for the drama is, will he die? It's not enough. Um, you know, you can threaten the lives of other characters. You can threaten to take away something uh, that's important to them. You can delay them. You can, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can add jeopardy to the scenario. So why use the only one that doesn't work? There's a lot of other just minor absurdities through it, but I think I, I think that is a good indication of kind of what you're gonna get out of this. In if it's it's a watchable bad movie, it's a very learnable bad movie. Like there's a lot of lessons that you can kind of take from the many many poor poor choices that are made uh, that are made in this movie. So you can learn a lot from picking apart kind of where where it goes wrong why it goes wrong what its failings are and so in in that regard like yeah it might be watchable it's if you're gonna put on a video game movie like with a group of friends that you can just like make fun of like clearly the the correct answer is still street fighter um or legend of chun li uh but this one, it is, it is a, it's a good addition. It's a good, bad addition to the, the canon of awful video game movies. Ah, frick. Oh, 
She got me good.